It had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, that today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, and found it even so as the women had said. But him, that's Jesus, they saw not. Then he, that's again Jesus, said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets, notice, all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus doesn't even go back to what he had told them. He goes back to the Old Testament prophets. You're slow to believe what they said. Verse 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now, question, time out, verse 26. Just in your mind, if you can think, where is a, who is an Old Testament prophet that foretold that Jesus was going to suffer and die? Isaiah. All right. Um, he is bruised and wounded. By his stripes we are healed. The the prophet in Isaiah said, and so these. These men, again, the problem is they had this idea of who Jesus was supposed to be, but he didn't fit their idea because he didn't act like a Savior or a Messiah is supposed to act. He is dead. In their mind, he, he was put in a sepulcher. They watched him as he was crucified, and they watched as the, the blood was shed, and they watched as, as the, the centurion stuck his spear into his side, and out came blood and water, and they knew that he was dead, and, and it just it didn't fit. They couldn't see the forest for the trees. Right? They got lost in the trees, and that's what Jesus is telling them. Fellas, how come you didn't understand even what the prophets said? And so, verse 27. And beginning at Moses. Now who's Moses? Or what's Moses? What are we talking about? What, what's Moses? First five books of the Bible. Right? Moses authored the first five books. The Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Jesus goes all the way back to the book of Genesis... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning who? Himself. You mean Jesus is in the book of Levit Leviticus? You better believe that he is. He's all over the book of Leviticus, in fact. He's all over the book of Numbers. He's all over every book. Now, is his name mentioned, is the name Jesus Christ mentioned in those Old Testament books? No. No. But he's there. Right? Whether it's him showing up in a pre-incarnate um, um, body. He does that to Abraham. He does that several times. He does that to Jacob. I mean, whether it's that or if just these prophets that are speaking of him. He is, he's throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. So Jesus is, is uh, trying to instruct these men. Verse 28, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further, but they had constrained him. No, stay with us, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening. And the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and brake, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they didn't just stay there and say, man, wasn't that great? They walked seven miles back to Jerusalem and tell the other disciples, hey, we saw him. He's real. And as they're telling the other disciples, Jesus appears in the midst and he says, touch me, see the wounds in my side, put your hands in the nail prints. It really is me. It's not some ghost or some spirit or some, some warm feeling that you want to have. It's absolutely me. In fact, he sits down and he eats with them. To prove to them, it really is me. I'm really back in, in bodily, human form. And they just, it's amazing what Jesus does uh, in their sight. In fact, verse number 45 of Luke 24, look at what he says. And then opened he their understanding. Notice, that they might understand the Scriptures. <laughs> I just love how the Bible comments on itself. It's the best commentary on itself. 
Jesus says, fellas, it was all there put out for you in the Old Testament if you just would have understood. Now, is it fully their fault? No, I don't think so. I think I'd lay a lot of blame on the teachers of the day, those rabbis who didn't understand either, by the way. They're too busy uh, building themselves up and building up their own reputations and looking for praise to themselves rather than teaching and instructing the people about Jesus Christ the righteous. By the way, if you remember, um, and we'll look at this in our series in Matthew on Sunday mornings, but when um, the wise men come to Herod in Matthew chapter number 2, you remember that uh, Herod gathers together the wise men of the day where he's at. In fact, it's, it talks about the scribes that Herod gathers together. And he says, where is Jesus to be born? And they didn't have to struggle to come up with the answer. They knew where he was supposed to be born. They said in Bethlehem is where he's supposed to be born. But were any of them there? No. <laughs> they weren't even waiting for their Messiah to come. They knew what the Scripture said. They just didn't apply it in their life. They didn't put their trust in it. What a sad thing. And so they, they've led people astray. In fact, Jesus would say, you're the blind leading the blind. You're not using what God has given to you to lead God's people in the right way. And again, this is just kind of review. We'll get to where we are here in just a moment uh, tonight. We went through all of this and we started this whole thing talking about the story and, and this narrative of Scripture and how it just weaves through different stories and different people's lives. And again, it's all focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just made some statements about what the Bible is not. So I'm going to review those real quick and then we'll get into the lesson tonight. What the Bible is not, first of all, number one, the Bible is not essentially. And there's a key word, essentially. Now the Bible is going to have these things in it. But it's not essentially these things. It's not just these things. The Bible is not essentially a book of instruction on moral behavior. Again, does the Bible have instruction on moral behavior? Uh, yeah, a lot. But it's not essentially that. All right. I learn what I should do. I learn what I shouldn't do from God's Word. But that's not all that's there. Number two. The Bible is not essentially a manual for self-improvement or virtue. All right? It is not just a book that tells me how to be better, live better, do better, how to make my own life better. It's mainly not about me. Now, in our world that we live in today, that is like, um, you know, it's almost abuse that you tell somebody, it's not all about you. All right? um, I tell my kids all the time, Bubba, it ain't all about you. All right? Nor is it all about me. It ought to be all about the Savior. All right? I ought to live my life for Him. And that's, again, what we're talking about with the Bible. Number three, the Bible is not essentially a book of judgment, wrath, or punishment. Now, you know people and I know people that think that this book is just full of God being mad at everyone else. Well, everyone is disobedient and everyone is unrighteous and so God's just mad at everybody. Now, there's some wrath in there. <laughs> there's some judgment in there. All right? But it's not essentially all about that. All right? Number four. The Bible is not essentially a book of rules. Again, it contains rules. Several sets of rules. All right? But it's not just about rules. Number five. The Bible is not essentially a book of inspiring his heroic stories or myths. All right? um, David and Goliath is a true story. That actually happened. All right? um, Jesus rising again the third day is not a myth uh, as the liberal mindset, even liberal Christians today would, would say, well, it was, it's probably not the case. Something happened to his body. And, uh, you know, it was just the, the disciples were wanting him to be there and they were really missing him. And so there was this figment of their imagination that appeared before them. No. You're going to have to do some serious gymnastics with Scripture to get to that point. All right? um, it's not heroic stories. It's not just myths. And we'll talk a little bit about that again uh, in just a little bit here, specifically about David and Goliath. But it's not, not any of those things. It, it, there are good stories, but they're true stories, not myths. Number six. The Bible is not essentially a book about you and what you should do. All right? There's, again, stuff that you should do, but it's not all about that. It's not just a book about um, 
or that presents, I guess I'd say, it's not just a book that presents right living, it's a book that presents answers for our wrong living. Right? Here's what you're doing wrong, here's the person that can help you to live right. By the way, when someone trusts Christ as their Savior, we would say, praise the Lord. Hopefully we don't expect them to come in a nice three-piece suit and have everything together by next Sunday. All right? There might be some time of growth in there. All right? um, now, I think there's going to be some fruit in their life. Sure, um, that will happen eventually. All right? But it's not going to happen right away. When I get saved, there's, the Holy Spirit comes into my heart, into my life, and one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict me of sin. All right? So I find myself doing something that I shouldn't do. The Holy Spirit says, uh-uh, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'm supposed to be brought to a point of conviction, and then I'm supposed to confess or agree with God about my sins. And the Bible says, when I confess, when I agree with God about my sin, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. All right? Um, we'll talk about that in another sermon. There's a difference between sin and sins. I'm cleansed from my sin, but I have little sins that I do or sins throughout the day that I also need to be washed from. All right? Throughout the day to keep my, my walk, my testimony sure. Okay? So I get convicted of these sins and um, I try harder to stop doing what I shouldn't be doing. I mean, I, I really... I'm trying, but it doesn't work. You know why? Because I try in my own strength. See, I can't, I can't live life for Christ in my own strength. Right? Um, I already tried doing things in my own strength, and that was leading me to on the path of destruction. All right. Um, sometimes, I mean, I've heard a lot of preaching about, uh, well, you just need to do better and try harder and... and um, I'm telling you, that's setting us up for failure. Because if it's us trying, we're going to fail. Because we dwell in this body of flesh. And the flesh is going to fail. And if we put strength in the flesh, we're going to be exactly where the Apostle Paul says. Okay, I've got the flesh and I've got the spirit and they war one against the other. And I know what I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick the flesh every time because I like doing that stuff. But if I'm allowing Christ to live His life through me, guess what? Now I have new strength. I have new power. I can resist sin because I'm letting Christ live through me. Not buying harder in and of myself. Does that make sense? We're going to... That's a continuing theme. We're going to continue on that. Alright? Uh, number seven. The Bible is not essentially a book of answers for social or moral problems. Alright? Again... Um, I'm having this problem. Show me in the Bible where I can get rid of the problem. Well, that might not always be the case. All right? I might not be able to take you to one specific place. All right? um, you're having money problems. Well, there's a lot of money issues in the Bible, but not just one specific topic. All right? The Bible isn't necessarily topical on those things. All right? Hopefully that makes sense. And then number eight. The Bible is not essentially answers to all of my questions. All right? It has some answers. But it answers the most important questions. It answers the questions God wants me to know. Right? Now, that gets us to where we are tonight. And tonight's a more brief. We'll work our way through it. What the Bible is not, we talked about that now. Okay, so what is the Bible? What the Bible is, number one. The Bible is God's story. The Bible is God's story. And you can write the word, if you're taking notes, you can write the word narrative next to that. All right? The Bible is God making sense to you and to me about who He is and what He's doing. If we were just to um, go through life and understand that, okay, God is working and God is moving, but without this book, it would be very hard to understand what He's doing or why He's doing it. All right? He's bringing things to pass. He's bringing events uh, in history and in, in modern times. He's bringing things to this, this point again of where he's going to return and take his saints to glory. And uh, then there comes the tribulation and then we return with him to rule and reign on the earth in the millennial reign. He's driving history to that point now. All right? But how do we know that? Because of this book. 
Right? See, I wouldn't understand that apart from what the Bible tells me. And so the Bible is God explaining who He is, what He's doing in the world. All right? It explains who I am. And then it explains how I fit into this story. You understand? I hope you understand. You fit into this story. All right? You, you ought to find yourself in this book, all right? where all of this is going. Now, why is it important? Well, because if that's true, then my life ought to change because of the Bible. Right? I ought to be living differently. I ought to have new hope because of what the Bible says. It's why understanding the narrative of the Bible and me getting into the Bible and me studying the Bible and me reading the Bible, that's what changes me. So I go through my daily Bible reading plan and I'm just kind of, man, I'm not really getting this. I'm not understanding. I'm just kind of checking off things off of the list and saying, well, yeah, I read my Bible again, but I'm not certain how it all fits together. That's why we're doing this study. Right? To say, okay, there's this whole narrative that runs through the entire book, and if you'll see Christ in this book, it'll help you understand and fit pieces together. Right? The Bible is God's story. And if that's again true, then it ought to change my life. Right? Because if I don't understand the Bible, if I don't understand God's Word, then I don't understand God. Right? I don't understand my part in things. I don't understand what he's doing. I don't understand how I fit into the story. And it means then, if I don't understand it, then I create my own story. Which means, I'm lost. Because if I'm creating my own story, guess what I'm going to say about myself? <laughs> I'm a pretty good person. You might not think so, but I'm pretty good. And I think God loves me. And, you know, I think uh, my good works will outweigh my bad works. You understand? If I get to make my own story, how I make myself look better, or I get to make up whatever bit of salvation I want. Hello, that's what a lot of people do today. Right? We, we make up our own stories. Well, here's what I think about the Bible. Here's what I think about God. As kindly as I can say it, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God says. Right? So I have to find out what he says, and I, I need understanding for that. Right? Um, you and I know people who don't understand this Bible. They don't understand God's book, and they're searching for something. And so they turn to money. They, turn to, they go from relationship to relationship to relationship. They go from pleasure to pleasure to pleasure. They go from job to job to job. Because they're searching for, where do I belong in this world? What, what, what is my part? What, what am I supposed to do? Who am I? Um, why am I here? What, what is the purpose of life? Where is all this going? Surely it's not just that I cease to exist and that's all that there is to it. Yeah, you're right. There is, that isn't all that there is to it. You know how you know that? Because God put that on your little heart. The book of Romans talks about that. All right? So we need to understand, again, what is, what is God saying? we live in this postmodern world. That's a term that people like to use. And so the story becomes, well, there are no answers to those questions. There is no story. Right? You, you just, you go about your merry way and whatever it is you say is okay and, and they try to get rid of in their heart that part that longs for God, that understands, I need God in my life. And so they, they take all the bad stuff and they, they, they can't weave it together to understand how God might be bringing things about and convicting them and trying to get a, a, their attention so that he can show them love and grace and mercy. Because we are a part of God's story. Right? Um, now, narrative. What is that? What am I talking about when I say narrative? Here's just a silly illustration. Little Red Riding Hood or, Little Red Riding Hood uh, was given some uh, bits of food to take to her grandmother's house, but there was this big bad wolf, and the big bad wolf wanted to eat Little Red Riding Hood. Right? Now, which one of those is a better story? Little Red Riding Hood, or Little Red Riding Hood and a big bad wolf? Well, I think we would understand Little Red Riding Hood and a big bad wolf is a better story. There's, there's this tension that goes with the story. Okay, well... <laughs> What happens to the Little Red Riding Hood? Does she become like a strawberry on top of the cupcake for the wolf? I mean, what, what happens to her? Right? There, there's an idea that, okay, the, the story is going somewhere, not just, well, there's a little girl in a red hood. Right? That's not a story. 
And so the Bible has this, this narrative tension, and the idea is, how does the tension get resolved? And we talked about it at the conclusion last week. The tension is this, God is holy and righteous and just, all right? And we read most of that in the Old Testament. So we, then we turn to the New Testament and we see God is love. And God showing grace and mercy. Can God be loving, uh, loving rather, and lovely and showing grace and mercy and at the same time be altogether righteous and holy and hate sin? Can those two things coexist together? All right. Now the answer is yes, but that's because you cheat and you know some of the Bible already. All right. <laughs> But to the average mind, you understand there's a problem here. How can a holy, righteous God still allow sinners into heaven? By the way, I talk to plenty of people who have that problem in their own mind. I don't understand. Right? Um, I I've done too many bad things. Right? God could never forgive me. Well, they know holy, righteous God who's angry at sin, but they haven't yet met loving, gracious God who provided a way so that their sin could already be taken care of. Right? Um, praise the Lord that when Jesus was on the cross, He cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cries that out so that I don't ever have to say that. Because God never leaves me, God never forsakes me. Why? Because Jesus met the demands of holy, righteous God. And now God can offer to me Grace and mercy. See, God doesn't wink at sin. Sin was paid for by His Son. Right? And so that's how the narrative gets, gets brought together is, okay, there's this Old Testament God who seems pretty judgmental and pretty angry at stuff, and if you don't obey, He's going to keep a tight ship. Yeah, but there's someone called Jesus Christ who comes in the New Testament. Right? And we'll talk some more about that. But that's the idea of narrative. All right? um, someone wrote this. I thought it was interesting. At the center of every true event and portion of the narrative of the Bible is a baby. Every page whispers his name. He's like the missing piece in a puzzle. The piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. And suddenly when you understand it's about a baby, you suddenly see the beautiful picture. All right? So, let's make some application. David and Goliath. If, if we read the Bible in such a way that's essentially just about us and, and, and what we sh are supposed to do, then you basically read the story of David and Goliath something like this. Go be like David and go kill all of your giants and trust God will help you. Now that's not necessarily a terrible application, but it's inferior to the main point of the story. Right? Um, how about... Picture yourself as the one who is taken captive by the Philistines. And then here comes this deliverer out of nowhere that no one really expected or knew about. And he says, I'll take care of that giant that's taken you captive. And he comes out and by faith in God, he takes care of the giant and sets you free. Do you understand how there's a, lot, there's a different interpretation in those two ways of looking at Scripture? All right. If I'm thinking just about myself, then it's do the best you can. You're going to have giants, so you might as well find a way to fight them. Or, how about Jesus is a lot better at fighting those battles than I ever could, and he can get deliverance when I can't. All right. Just, again, some application here. If, if the Bible is essentially about Jesus, and that's what Jesus is saying in Luke chapter number 24, then again, you're taken hostage by the Philistines, Jesus is your David who goes out alone in your place to rescue you and everyone like you from that giant. Right? It, it's not a story primarily about how you can gain victory if you'll just work harder, try better. Right? It's primarily about substitution. You couldn't win the battle, but Jesus Christ can and he did. So will you trust him? Abraham and Isaac. All right, one more example. If the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter number 22 is about you, then the way you read the story is, I'm Abraham, God's given me the blessing of a son, something very important to me, and God's going to take it away. He asked me to kill it, get rid of it, sacrifice it. Now, okay, question. Does God ask us to surrender some things? Yes. 
Yes, but the application of Genesis chapter number 22 is not, well, if you've got these, these possessions or you've got these things in your life, you're going to have to give them up for God to really love you or God to really use you. That's not the story of Genesis chapter number 22. Right? The story of Genesis 22 is God will provide himself a lamb. Right? And literally that's what he did. God provided himself as a lamb for your sin. Right? That's the story. That's the application of Genesis chapter number 22. Not give all your stuff away and God will be more pleased with you. All right? Because I've heard that preached out of that passage more than I care to mention. And it just, man, we, we miss out if we think that the Bible is primarily just about us and, and how I'm supposed to act. It's not. It's primarily about Jesus Christ. Right? God sent His Son to earth in the form of a man and that one day His Son would walk on that hill and lay His back on a piece of wood and become a greater sacrifice for mankind. Right? The Bible is all God's story. It all points to Jesus Christ. He's the resolution of the tension of the Bible. Number two. The Bible is all about Jesus. Number two, the Bible is God's message. The rest of these are shorter. The Bible is God's message. The Bible is God's wisdom to me, telling me everything I need to know. Not necessarily everything I want to know, but everything I need to know. All right? For this life, to get through, to prepare for eternity, God's given me everything that I need to know. J.I. Packer, I wouldn't agree with all of his theology. I thought this statement was good. Scripture is God preaching. The Bible is the greatest sermon ever. It is God's sermon to us. That Bible is important. Number three. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to humanity. Right? Um, this is God condescending himself so that mankind could understand. Right? That's what this book is. That's what the Bible is. Um, if I... You, you think about this. If you heard God audibly tomorrow, you would probably be scared out of your wits. Yeah. Yeah. If you... Um, <laughs> if you saw God tomorrow, you'd be vaporized. Because he's so holy. So what the Bible is, is God bringing himself in a manner that we could understand. That we could see and look at. This is God, his word. Right? Um, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Right? He is scripture. All right? And it's our way to understand who He is. He's revealing Himself to us. Number four, the Bible is God's expression of love for us. You start in Genesis 1-1 and you end in the book of Revelation. And it's God saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Sometimes He loves you enough to correct you. Other times He loves you enough to encourage you. Sometimes He loves you enough to instruct you, to just put you back on the right path. But all through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, He is saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. The story of the Bible is, is God, He created man, man ran from God, God runs after man, and those who receive God, He redeems and gives the ultimate victory to. It's just, it's an amazing story. Every book, every chapter, every sacrifice, every law, every portion of Scripture somehow builds on this narrative that we've been talking about and it just shines more light on who Jesus is in the Bible. Number five, and finally, number five. The Bible is God's book all about Jesus. All right? God's book all about Jesus. And you just think, and if you haven't necessarily heard that or, or thought through that before, it, it can sound a little bit confusing or, or different. It seems like there's parts that predict him and his coming, and there, there's, there's prophecies and all those things, and then there's parts that talk about his time on earth, and, and there are pictures and symbols of Jesus, but is it really all about Jesus? Well, Jesus himself said in Luke 24, 27 that it was. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in 
How much of the scriptures? All the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. It's all about him. Right? So if you understand the story, you begin to understand your place in the timeline, so to speak. You begin to understand your role. You begin to understand what your purpose is. Now, turn to Ephesians and we're finished. Ephesians 1. I just want to show you some verses and we're done. Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Okay, this is Paul speaking to these people of the church of Ephesus. And he's saying, I heard of your faith. I'm praying for you. Now Paul's going to say, here's what he's praying about. And notice what he's praying for these people. And I want you to pay attention. Is he praying for them to do all the things God told them to do? In other words, to keep all the laws. Is Paul saying, I hope that you're uh, on your best obedience, on your best behavior. Well, let's look at what he says. Verse 17. Here's what he's praying. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. In other words, that you would understand everything that His book says about who He is. That's what Paul's praying for these people. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Wow, that's a great prayer. I hope somebody's praying that for me. <laughs> Man, that I would understand what God said in his book... And that I would understand that God gives me hope for everyday living. Right? He doesn't say, I hope you keep every rule. Right? Because He knows you're not going to. Right? There's hope for you. And there's help. And your sins have been paid for. But Paul says, I want you to know what God's will is for your life. That's what I'm praying. Right? Now, here's the cap. Or look at Ephesians 2, just across the page. Or maybe you have to turn the page. Ephesians 2, look at verse 4. Now, hold on to your socks, because this is good stuff. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, time out. All right? After verse 6... In your mind, you ought to ask the question, why did he do that? Why did, why? why did he make me quicken together with Christ? Why did he raise me up and make me sit together in heavenly places? Well, he answers it in verse number 7. Look at what he says. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Glory. <laughs> That's why he did it. That's why he extended grace to you. So that he can show others, hey, I've given grace to them, I can give grace to you. Look at what I've done in this person's life. They were hopeless. But look at what God's grace does in their life. By the way, you probably know people, or you maybe be one of those people who have that kind of testimony. Man, I was a worthless, no good scumbag. But look at what God did in my life. Ephesians 4 verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's what this Bible is all about. That you might experience God's grace in your life. And so God, this Bible is God showing himself to you in a way that you can understand. So that when you read it you can say, man he's good. I want to do what it is he's telling me to do. I want to live the life he in, is, can enable me to live. I can't do it in and of myself. I have to have him living his life in and through me. But I can ask for his help. 
And if I asked for his help, he said that he would help me. One of our verses for memorizing for this month is Colossians 2.6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How's that? By faith. So walk ye in him. So don't try to earn your salvation. You can't do it. It's by faith. In other, and on the other side, don't try to walk and live your Christian life by works. Trying to keep your salvation or keep God's good graces. No. Just walk by faith. You trust him by faith. Now walk by faith. Ask Him for help to live your daily life. Is it hard? Yes. Why? Because I have this rotten flesh that keeps getting in the way. Because I keep yielding to it. I've got to continue daily, day after day, moment by moment sometimes, Lord. Help me to let Christ live His life through me. Because I'm not doing it right now. I pray that prayer more than I'd like to admit. On a daily basis. Lord, I'm, I'm getting in the flesh again. Help me to walk by faith. Help me to let Christ live His life in and through me. And guess what? He will. He'll help me. He'll help to renew my mind, which will renew my actions. Right? It's just a wonderful thing. That's what this Bible is about. Praise the Lord. So we're going to get into it and see in each book where Christ is in those books, hopefully it will be a help to us. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you very much again for the day that you've given. Thank you again for the Bible. What a wonderful, wonderful book that you've given. Thank you for reconciling your holiness and justice and judgment because you are those things. Thank you for reconciling.